happier, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will return to the question. Smile a bit more. <laughs> well, it was pretty extraordinary welcome. It's flat. <laughs> Since coming to office just over a year ago, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has worked hard to develop his prime ministerial persona as an amiable everyman and a bloke in comfortable control. Instead of hyperventilating like a debating team, you need to bring people together to get things done. But as federal parliament rises for its winter recess, Things are getting a bit pointier in both politics and the wider world, and the PM has lost some of his bonhomie. His government has been under a bit more pressure, and the timelines of events between now and the next election are starting to close in. This motion would say that we can deal with the housing bill on October the 16th, after the Prime Minister comes back from National Cabinet and secures a deal. It is disappointing that so far the Prime Minister has done nothing for renters in this country. For the Greens political party, this isn't about the Australian people. This is about them. They want the issue, not the outcome. They want people to stay in poverty so they can have a rally against it. Minister, how can Australians trust your government when you refuse to admit that you misled the parliament? There was um, no mislead from my point of view. I did not know what was going to be made public when Senator Reynolds accused me of, uh, of knowing Thank that. You. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Would The Voice be able to make representations to the Chief of the Defence Force on military acquisitions or the location or operation of military order, bases? Order, Mr order, Speaker, the order. Prime Minister is laughing at me. Can order. I ask the question? On the face of it, there is a lot going for the government. Senior figures in the coalition despair about the divisions in both the Parliamentary Liberal Party and its organisational wing. The budget was well received, and a recent poll showed Labor is now the preferred party to handle the rising cost of living and interest rates, despite the pain of 12 interest rate hikes and inflation. We have pay packets growing at the fastest rate in more than a decade. The, the GDP growth of Australia is higher than all of, all of the G7 countries. But the government is now finding itself wedged by the Reserve Bank's continued relentless increases in interest rates on the one hand, and the Greens move this week to defer consideration of the government's proposed housing fund. And while it may have got legislation for the voice through the parliament, the pragmatic assessment within the government is that the referendum is in big trouble as the official campaign gets underway. And the government will be fighting that as the economy starts to really slow. We expect to see essentially no growth in the economy in the second half of this year and maybe into the first quarter of next year. Um, so for me, that means unemployment's got a four in front of it by Christmas, uh, about four and a half percent by the middle of next year and maybe five by the end of next year. Now, everyone says, is that a recession or not? It depends on your definition. My old definition that I've always had was if unemployment goes up by 1% over a 12-month period, that's close enough. And that's really what we've got. Um, now, whether you get two quarters of negative growth, I don't care is the honest answer. But I still think we're going to have essentially a moderate recession. Treasurer Jim Chalmers was speaking in slightly more oblique tones about this on radio this morning, but the message was the same. We try to be really upfront and say that we do expect the economy to slow considerably uh, over the coming months. So how does the conjunction of political and economic calendars line up in the next 12 to 18 months? The government suggested in response to the Greens' move to delay the housing fund until October that this might set up a trigger for a double dissolution election. A double dissolution trigger is gained when the Senate fails to pass a bill twice, with a minimum of three months in between. Let's be clear, the decision today by the Greens, uh, along with their partners, the, uh, the Coalition, rejected the bill to establish the Housing Australia Future Fund. The government's position is a little contentious. It is seeking legal advice on whether the Greens' action does constitute a failure to pass in terms of being a double dissolution trigger. If the government is serious, it could send voters back to the polls as early as this October, 
whereas the earliest a normal half-Senate election could be held is August next year. An early election would likely come right after the voice referendum and possibly just as the economy was bottoming out. I can't imagine the government would go to a double dissolution election over this, um, but I suppose this is the, the you know, upping the ante and, and trying to um, you know, play that game of brinksmanship. And I hope that the Greens and the government do actually work out a way to resolve it so we can get on with it. I don't think that it's fair to slow down the social housing process because of the problems with renters. While the government and the opposition have been squaring off on The Voice and the government and the Greens have been battling it out on housing, the rest of the substantial crossbench has been looking on. It's pretty awful seeing, um, seeing us take issues like sexual assault and weaponise them for political purposes. And I think that, um, that there's a real misunderstanding about how much appetite the, the, the country has for that, that sort of games. We, we're just sick to death of it, really. So much hinges on the shape, extent and length of the economic downturn. Alan Oster is reasonably optimistic about the outlook for 2025. It's not going to shoot the lights out, but 2% plus growth with unemployment under control and inflation under control, that's good. But things are getting dark in the meantime. We look at every transaction that goes across any electronic system in our, in our bank. So that's 5 million transactions a day. We now know that interest rates take at least 12 months to have their big impact. And we only started increasing rates around about May last year. What economists will tell you is that a recession this time around would be the first so-called policy-induced recession since the one in the early 1990s. That is, not a downturn caused by an external shock like the GFC or COVID, but one caused by deliberate policy decisions, in this case, those of the Reserve Bank. And like that earlier recession, this one could come about because changes in the economy mean no one knows what the impact of a sharp rate rise will be. Whilst we might have all these fancy models, a lot of this is applied psychology. We don't know how people are going to react to the fact that they had a really big increase in uh, their mortgage payments.